everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Paul, for, Thank for you, doing Joel. this tonight. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'll get started while we um, await additional uh, guests and uh, introduce Paul. Uh, while that is not really necessary, particularly in this house, to introduce Paul, though I would argue it's not necessary to introduce Paul in most locations because he's so um, uh, well known, especially in the in the areas um, around the writing on architecture and cities. Um, but in this house, it's really unnecessary, uh, though a great pleasure nonetheless. Um, we are going to talk tonight about. Um, Paul's new books, his two new books. And uh, I thought it uh, fitting in some ways to focus on the Why Architecture Matters book for a variety of reasons. Um, but in this uh, auditorium and in this Sheila Johnson Design Center, um, the Why Architecture Matters and the How Architecture is Made mm -hmm. um, are particularly relevant to Paul and his time as dean of Parsons because I would think it's uh, very reasonable to say that uh, without Paul's leadership we wouldn't be sitting in a room as beautiful as this. Uh, I would argue that this is the most beautiful um, uh, uh, lecture hall that we have on campus and the overall center, uh, the Sheila Johnson Design Center, for those of you who don't know the full story of it, it actually extends across three deans um, beginning with Randy Swearer. Uh, but under Paul, the question of how one makes architecture in an institutional context and how one fights the fights to defend the role of architecture and the value of architecture and the role of the architect um, in, in the, in the be to the benefit of the institution um, is undoubtedly the result, this room is the result of Paul fighting those fights for Parsons uh, and working with Lynn Rice uh, closely um, through the process of design to make this happen and then uh, to uh, continue doing those to defend this space further uh, under uh, Tim Marshall after Paul. Um, it's been, to inherit these spaces as a dean is a tremendous privilege and I think we all owe a great debt to all three of those deans right, and Paul you. in particular for this work. So um, it's great to have this event here in your house in many ways. It's wonderful to be here actually, <laughs> thank you Joel. Um, I, I don't, it's not necessary, though, again, a great pleasure to, to list the many achievements that Paul um, has, his Pulitzer Prize from his time with the New York Times, his many years of writing at the New Yorker uh, under the skyline um, uh, byline, the, uh, the most recent books, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, but the list is long and known to most of us um, from On the Rise, The City Observed, Up From Zero, um, the, the World Trade Center remembered above New York, uh, and the many lists of honors, uh, including um, uh, the President's Medal from the Municipal Arts Society, uh, the AIA Medal, Medal of Honor from the New York Landmarks Preservation Foundation, um, the, uh, the uh, Literary Lion Award from the New York Public Library, uh, the Ed Bacon Foundation Award for Professional Excellence, and uh, the Gene Bird Urban Journalism Award uh, from the Urban Communication Foundation. It's a, this is a partial list, <laughs> uh, and it's quite a remarkable one. Um, uh, Paul has, uh, for many, many years, been and continues to be uh, a, a powerful and leading voice in architecture and built space. So it's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, I, I wanted uh, to focus on the two books, as I said, but to, to begin really uh, with the Why Architecture Matters sure. because it's the new work. And um, I have a few questions that I wanted to ask Paul and then I also wanted to open it right. to the audience. So I'll begin there and I'll begin by saying that I read the book uh, once um, it, and put myself in the hands of a great writer, uh, which is to say I read it as he wrote it from the front page to the last page. Uh, I didn't jump around. And then I went through it a second time mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. started looking and I thought, well, sure, I, I got that version of it, but I wanted to start to look at the different chapters in different orders because they made different sense. I, mean, I was curious about your thinking about the structure of this book, just as a beginning. Sure, point. sure. Well, first, Joel, thank you very much for what you said about this space because I, I, I think it really was a product of a lot of people. Uh, I mean, the most important thing it represents, I think, is it, the university beginning to discover that 
architecture is not just something that they teach, but something they could also do. <laughs> and, um, and learning to be a client, uh, which I sort of was trained for by years at the New York Times, which for a long time was a terrible architectural client. Yes. And I used to say, how come all these people are paid by the company to build all the things that we're paid to write how terrible they are? I mean, how come there's this <laughs> disconnect between what we do and what, as a company and what we do writing in the newspaper? And similarly, there are a lot of institutions that have a disconnect between the architecture they teach and the architecture they make for their own home. And, and uh, this represented, I think, really largely due to Randy Swearer's efforts before me, the beginnings of a kind of turnaround that's now continued with the other projects the university's doing. But uh, even though it's relatively small, it was sort of the first time the university decided to invest in actually being a client as opposed to just teaching people about architecture. And so, so uh, there were a lot of people to thank for it, really. And I think my, my role was pretty, pretty small in the middle of that. But um, I saying all that both to thank you and to explain it fully and also to put off for a few seconds answering your question. Um, <laughs> uh, but I mean, the way this book is organized, I think, in a way, has to do with the idea behind it, which is to write a different kind of architecture book. It's not a history of architecture, of which there's a zillion. It's not a guide to styles. It's not an architectural dictionary. You know, it's not where you go to find out the difference between a Corinthian and ionic column, or what a buttress is, or that stuff. Um, it's really about seeing and ways to experience architecture. And it... Um, was organized, therefore, not chronologically, not by kinds of buildings. In fact, it's really a, a kind of uh, almost polemic against classifying buildings in the normal ways and against style as a, as a, as a defining thing, and toward just ways we experience it. So there's a chapter about space. There's a chapter about uh, architecture as cultural symbol. There's a chapter about time and memory and, and things like that. Uh, a chapter about buildings working together to make urban spaces. And uh, as well as chapters about, a chapter about the building just as a pure object in itself. Uh, and I realized after it was done that, in fact, the order wasn't all that important. So you're probably right that, you know, and I, played around with a couple of different orders, and this one sort of felt right, and the editor said it felt right. But in the end, uh, probably reading it, I won't say reading it backwards would be just as good as reading it forwards. It's not quite like that, but, but the, there's seven chapters, and they were meant to almost stand alone as essays, really. Um, not totally, but almost. I mean, they, they come together to create a whole, but they can st pretty much stand alone. And so, yeah, I think they could be read in different orders, but you'd get only a partial picture. I mean, if you read architecture, the chapter Architecture as Space, for example, um, is, I mean, I, I kind of like it. I think it's okay, but it, it's, uh, it is supposed to be read within the larger context of all the other ways in which we experience architecture. And if you read it, I think it's four, the fourth chapter. If you read it fourth, or you read it third or fifth, I don't know that it makes that much difference yeah. in the end. Yeah. But yeah. What, I, what I'd like to do is to sort of take a, um, a certain amount of liberty by sure. combining them and, and drawing mm -hmm. a few sure, questions sure, out sure. That, that, for me at least, were fascinating mm -hmm. in the book. And I think the book is, is quite brilliant in a, in, a, in a variety of ways, not just because it's um, capable of, of working, of, of making an edited mm -hmm. and concrete and clear argument which allows us to say, first, I, I often find myself reading saying, well, come on, Paul, what about this or what about that? And either it shows up in the next chapter or, or it's in fact extraneous to the argument. But the, the, I want to pull some chapters sure, together sure, and ask sure, a few sure. key questions sure, from my sure, perspective. Sure. So I, I want to start with space, place, and time. Mm -hmm. each, and I've just taken the last word of the titles of each of the chapters, as you've suggested. They're also about those things. Um, so you, could space, a, you could write a whole book, maybe space, space time, place. architecture. Indeed, you know, indeed. yes, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there are some. Yeah, right, right. Exactly. And so uh, I wanted to, if we if we draw those three things together, um, 
it struck me that one of the things that comes out of the book mm -hmm. is th an understanding of the role of perspective, and I don't mean here in terms of constructed perspective, right. but the role of the viewer and where mm -hmm, one mm -hmm. sees architecture from. And you're clearly interested, it seems to me, in this book in trying to uh, help people understand how they are seeing architecture. So right. there's this perspectival component to it. But the, the space, place, and time piece also suggests to me um, an interest in its meaning in relationship to that perspective. So it's not just how we see it, but what is meant by um, those three characteristics. And it reminded me of a kind of geography and, mm -hmm. um, and the notion that, uh, for example, that architecture has the capacity to, um, to inspire not just in the sense of a utopian alternative, mm -hmm, but nonetheless mm -hmm. um, to use as an imaginary tool the role of architecture to see a different future in space right. or in place or in relationship to time. And I was reminded as I was reading this of David Harvey's construct and construction of those things, uh, and in particular a kind of s a utopia of spatial process or a utopia, a spatial form or a, a social process. And so I, I was curious if you, if you could think about the role of how we see, how far we see, where we see from in relationship to space and place and time, because you, you captured each aspect mm -hmm, of it mm -hmm. uh, in each of those chapters. Do you mean how we see them all together in a way? I mean, how well, do they how they relate yeah. to each other, and how mm -hmm. they, for example, you know, uh, if we think about the interiority of space or mm -hmm. the role of architecture as an object to produce place, right? And how those two things are related, but increase in in uh, additionally, the role that they play in our understanding. Uh, of communities in and in time. So, in other words, these you you talk a lot about in the book um, uh, the the understanding of different pieces of architecture right. in relationship to our time or historical time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, I'm I'm wanting to pull these three things together in saying why why does architecture matter? Well, it matters in part in relationship to the production of space, the production of place, and how we understand it over time but it has characteristics that you're interested in. It does things. Architecture inspires or it affords us the possibility, as you've suggested um, over and over in the book, to uh, um, Im import meaning to certain mm -hmm. kinds of conditions. So I want to tease out meaning and place and space and time from those three chapters. OK, well, let's try. <laughs> um, it, I mean, I, I, let me start by saying, uh, since you referenced David Harvey earlier, uh, one thing I think the book is not is utopian. Um, it's uh, perhaps somewhat idealistic, but not utopian, and does not presume a utopian condition at all. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's idealistic, but more in the, I hate to use a, a non-architectural word like this, but almost in an earnest way. Uh, is it idealistic, not in a uh, pursuit solely of the ideal. Because in fact, um, there is a fair amount of discussion of the issue of vernacular architecture and the relationship of the monumental to the everyday and, and so forth. So um, I think everything we say on these subjects has to be seen in that light, really. Um, the, um, I think, I think the issues of, while I understand what you're getting at with your question, I'm not entirely sure uh, where an answer should go because the, um, one, of the, one of the key things for me is the uh, often significantly different ways in which different times perceive space. Yes. And in fact, before the 19th century, space was not even part of the vocabulary of architecture. I mean, it was, uh, no, nobody walked into a Borromini church in the 18th century and said, what an interesting space, because they didn't think that way. They didn't talk that way. Um, even though, in fact, spatially, it's extraordinarily powerful and indeed profound and, and extraordinary. Um, but it was not, 
uh, space was still seen as what was left over when you crafted a structure. Uh, the um, relationship between the everyday and the monumental and the special, I think, is also paralleled by uh, the way in which I believe at least so much architecture emerges from certain, you know, relatively basic and pragmatic beginnings um, and often is seen by later times and different cultures to represent something else altogether. Um, and so we, we read everything within the context of our own time and our own perceptions. And we do that in two different ways. We do it both in terms of how our perceptions are shaped by the, the larger sense of a time, you know, zeitgeist for want of a better term, and by our own individual experience, which is uh, different for each of us, even within a similar time. And so everybody perceives everything somewhat differently, and also collectively different times perceive things differently. And inevitably, things actually change over time, too. Yeah. So we, we're, we're dealing with moving targets in terms of perception. Um, the thing itself changes, and our point of view changes continually. Um, it's very hard to be more specific than that unless we're talking about a particular example, mm -hmm. in which case we could say, you know, that um, of building X such and such a time viewed it this way and then another time for this reason had a very different point of view about it. Mm. Um, I, I think it's hard beyond what I've just said to make general comments that are that Meaningful. That's one reason, by the way, that this book kind of keeps moving toward examples yes. without actually ever being in any way about um, Jefferson's lawn at the University of Virginia or the Vietnam Veterans Memorial or Borromini's Santivo or the Lincoln Memorial. I'm just thinking of buildings that are talked about here. Um, it, it's always easier to explain a precept through an example. Then, so, well, yeah. let's mm -hmm. let so let's think sure. about let's think okay. about an example then, right. because I think it, and and maybe to do that, um, I want to I want to draw two more of the sure. chapters. Sure, the sure, chapter, sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Chapter on on memory and the chapter on challenge and comfort. Right. Which I quite like. Oh, um, thank you. A great okay. deal. Um, yeah, I like that one too. The, the interesting the reason I'm mm -hmm. putting I want to put memory together with right. the challenge is because often uh, memory fails us. We forget the challenges first of all, right? And <laughs> In hindsight, it never seemed as hard as it was. So there's this role that memory plays, which is to say, right. forgetting. Uh, right, right. That's in particular, true. I'm interested if you could think about an example. It's reasonable to argue, and I think your book gets at aspects of this, that architecture is kind of made three times. Mm -hmm. uh, the f its first construction is uh, uh, on paper, if you will, right. the imagination. It's mm -hmm. more in increasingly in the digital space, but it's made. Um, not in physical form, but out of the imagination right. of the architects working on it mm -hmm. and factors. It's then made in physical form as right. the second construction. And it's remade or made again historically in terms of its meaning, its interpretation. Absolutely its right. And indeed, within those, each of those three times, particularly the third one, consists of a million sub-things, of yes. course, that are continually changing and evolving. So I'm right. curious if you could think mm -hmm. about examples that kind of draw out the, those three steps, because they, because each of them, in some way, is a different building, uh, different from the perspective of the architect, different from the perspective of the builders, but also increasingly, it changes. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to, in a way, decenter the building mm -hmm, and put mm -hmm. it in the cultural context that you're um, writing about in many ways. So are there examples that you can think of whose meaning have changed so significantly over time? Let's say. Uh, as they've been interpreted, or uh, you're, you're writing on the Lincoln Memorial, for example, mm -hmm. as one. Now, the Lincoln Memorial is a good a good thing to talk about, I think, because um, uh, there, I think, it's a combination of the time and my bringing my own uh, perceptions to it. Yes. Uh, so I don't know that everyone would have precisely the reading I did, um, and that's fresh in my mind. Uh, not. Uh, so much from being in Washington recently, but um, I gave a talk just a couple weeks ago at that very strange school of architecture at the University of Notre Dame, where you know they they sometimes act as if it were still the uh, 
16th century and teach everyone that classicism is sort of the way you make architecture. And I decided I would sort of go and talk about, uh, I was asked to talk again about this book, but I would talk about the references to classical architecture in the book and talked a lot about the Lincoln Memorial and made the argument that in fact the Lincoln Memorial is a modern building, it's a radical building, and it is as much an anti-Parthenon as it is a use of the Parthenon because it's, and the reason it's a brilliant building is the way in which it takes the ideas of the Parthenon and totally transforms forms them into something actually quite abstract and modern, really. I mean, it's a box with a bunch of columns around it which is not really the same as a Greek temple. And uh, now I tend probably to view it that way rather more than the average person at Notre Dame might view it that way, say. <laughs> um, uh, although they didn't throw me out for saying it. So it's sort of, uh, um, and, they, 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 <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, I, because I, I think I bring to it my own, modernist bias, which is uh, constantly at war with my fundamental Catholic, with a small c, not related to Notre Dame, my fundamentally Catholic view of architecture, my broad view of architecture, because I, I and in fact, part of the story of this book, it, it really, it, it was written in part to come to terms with why I liked everything. And, and how, how can you be a serious art historian and critic if you like everything? I mean, I don't literally like everything, but I like, I like good buildings of all types. And I have struggled for a while um, with the sort of guilt that is foisted upon one sometimes for um, having almost too broad-minded a view as if that indicated an absence of abilities of discernment and judgment and so forth. Um, so part of the motivation behind this book was actually to respond to that, which is why the stuff about classical buildings is, is important because I, and in fact I talk a little bit, since a little bit of it, there's a little bit of memoir woven into it too, especially in that one memory chapter about um, coming to Yale as a student. Uh, you know, the Paul Rudolph and Louis Kahn buildings and Saarinen buildings were what excited me and what I thought, you know, would be the... And indeed, actually, I, did, I did really did like them, uh, like some of them. I didn't love all of them, anyway. Um, but what I wasn't prepared for was how much I loved all the fake Gothic architecture, which you weren't supposed to like. <laughs> and I spent a long time literally, you know, agonizing over this and, and you know, am I some sort of, am I inadequate to the... Uh, to the mission of architecture, if I, if I like this stuff, am I just some sort of, you know, empty-headed, sentimental fool? I mean, what, you know, do I ha or do I actually have, you know, an eye that means something? And uh, anyway, so I think all of those, uh, that ex those experiences um, contribute something to my reading of the Lincoln Memorial yeah. uh, and my desire to see in it uh, something that may be more modern than Henry Bacon actually intended. But nonetheless, that's what the object says to me. And I think there's sufficient evidence within the object to say that that's what it is, even if that was not his intention. Mm. So if we think back to the three stages or, uh, or three lives of architecture that you've talked about, um, it's very plausible that Henry Bacon wanted something more literally like a Greek temple than I'm reading it as. Although, in fact, if you look back, and I have somewhat at his own uh, uh, writings about the building and the contemporary things, uh, it's made clear that he, he was certainly not trying to pull a Nashville. You know that, that famous yeah. thing in Nashville, in Centennial Park in Nashville, where there is a literal copy of the Parthenon. Um, he had no interest in that whatsoever. So he, he was definitely reinventing it to some extent and knew, and knew that and was comfortable with that. Um, I've probably, since I want to justify liking it, I've probably exaggerated the extent of reinvention slightly. But I, but I, th I think the, the evidence pretty much holds up. 
And, uh, uh, and then, as you say, I mean, we continue, each time continues to read new things into it, uh, which of course are the result not only of our own experiences, not only of the broader cultural view of a particular kind of architecture, but also of the history of the thing itself. Yes. Because of course now it is impossible to look at the Lincoln Memorial and not think of Marian Anderson, and not think of Martin Luther King, and I Have a Dream, and all of those things are an inevitable part of any reading of that building. Uh, but of course they could not be part of the architect's intention because they hadn't happened. Do you think, I mean, I was, I was, I, I like the recasting mm -hmm. or the position against Mumford's view, for example, on the memorial. It's a one line in the, in the piece, that, in the, in the right, essay. Right, 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 right. But yeah. to some degree, the accumulation of events also right. change, therefore, the meaning of the building. They ch I think that's true with any building. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, I mean, the, which is only a way of confirming the very thing you've already said, which is a building has a life that, uh, a third life that begins when the construction is finished and the life takes over and then it goes on and on and has layers and layers of meaning over time and, um, and that's inevitably how it is. Um, Mumford, well, you know, whatever. I mean, Mum Mumford, uh, uh, I think, was the most brilliant frequently wrong person who's ever written about <laughs> architecture. Um, I mean, I, I, I have such enormous admiration for Mumford, and yet the ratio of admiration to agreement is like totally out of whack with Mumford. I said, I, you know, he might be the only person I admire more than I agree with. And so. <laughs> um, the, speaking of, of the way uh, buildings acquire new meaning over yeah, time, yeah. Um, I want to, there's a, there's a theme that runs through the book that mm -hmm. um, is, I think, only partially developed. And mm -hmm. I, I mean this in the most constructive of, of, of okay, well, criticism. Okay, well, maybe for a second edition, we can always well, uh, welcome well, help in, here. In some way, it points you know, to what okay. is, is to work undone in architecture. Okay. So to some mm -hmm. degree, it's, it's not a failure of the text. It's a failure of the work of architecture to address a question mm -hmm. that okay. I think we've come up against several times. And that is that the book seeks to claim as architecture all building at yes, a certain level. Right, right, right. right. Uh, and yet, the vast majority of buildings are not have nothing to do with an architect. They never see an architect. Right, right. In cities, right. the percentage is higher, but uh, but across the right, board, depends right. who you quote. It's right, no, no, you, you, right, well, well, uh, 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 right, exactly, right. With uh, an architect, mm -hmm, and so there's an attempt mm -hmm. to claim the vernacular, to claim the everyday. Right. And yet, the book continues to go back to the examples that are easier to to speak to. Right of the masterwork, mm -hmm. of the architect's production of architecture. And I, there's a tremendous affinity and desire in the book to right. speak to the value of the everyday. Yes. And architects have tried and I think uh, arguably may have failed over many attempts to try to claim that space as well. Um, and so I, it's, in a way it points to what's, what might be next about mm -hmm. the everyday. Mm -hmm. It may mm -hmm. point to more work on the part of the construction of the everyday, but also the writing about it and the, and, the, sure. and the language of it. So I was curious if you could explore that a bit. Yeah, more. no, I, I'd like to. Um, well, the first thing, and the most important thing to say, I think, is that to argue for the importance of the everyday, uh, argue for the impact the vernacular has on us, and for the need to take it more seriously than, say, you know, I mean, I use, as a, and I admit, a straw man, uh, Nicholas Pevsner. Uh, with his famous line about Lincoln Cathedral, uh, I mean, a bicycle shed is a building, Lincoln Cathedral is architecture. And I'm saying, wait a minute, you know, the bicycle shed has some connection with our lives too. Um, so to argue against that position is not to equate the everyday with the great and the monumental. It's merely to say um, it behooves us to pay attention to these things and to recognize their impact on our lives. Um, I think that, that view, uh, which in some ways is not altogether different from, say, you know, uh, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown and their arguments in favor of, an, of uh, a different view of the American vernacular now, you know, 30 and 40 years ago already. Um, as that was often mistaken for a desire to equate 
the two. Um, and I know that it used to make Bob Venturi crazy when people would think that because he discussed the Las Vegas Strip in terms that made reference to Rome, that people thought, therefore, he thought that the Stardust Hotel was the equivalent of the Pantheon. And, you know, he said no such thing and meant no such thing by it. Um, and similarly, I'm, I'm not trying to equate these two in that way, merely that there is uh, much to be learned from them. There is sometimes much to be admired in them, but not always. Um, and whether good or ill, they have a great effect on us. They are not neutral presences. The uh, presumption in that Pevsner line, uh, the implicit statement, he never says it literally, is that the bicycle shed has absolutely no impact on your life, so pay attention to Lincoln Cathedral because that's the only thing that matters. Uh, and I'm saying they both have an impact on, our, on your life and they bo it behooves you to understand and pay attention to both, but that does not mean to equate them both. Okay, so that's the first, I think, important thing to say. Um, the other thing, and, and I'm glad you said perhaps there's a failure uh, on the part of architecture rather than a failure on the part of the text. Um, uh, first, because I, uh, I have responsibility for one and not the other. Um, so in that sense, that's, that's good to hear. Um, uh, but it also, it goes to a point that I, I think I said in the book at some point, uh, but I certainly meant to if I didn't, and I've said elsewhere enough, which is that the great failure of modern architecture was not in any way, shape, or form an inability to create great buildings. It was a serious problem with creating a vernacular. Uh, it did not create a good urbanism, and it did not create good ordinary buildings. And I still think that's, that remains a critical issue. Um, why, and, and uh, this, for reasons I don't entirely understand, this continues to fascinate me as a problem, in part because I guess I'm so interested in where um, the serious act of making architecture on a profound level as a work of art and general popular perception intersect. Um, and what flows from that, I think, is an interest in the challenge of the vernacular, as it were, and the fact that a uh, hundred years ago, uh, you know, they made ordinary buildings pretty well, you know? I mean, uh, we all kind of like brownstones, from, right? I mean, they're all pretty good, no matter what your view of architecture is. You think, you know, this is a very good building type. And while there may have been greater and lesser ones, and there's certainly a range of artists, that was a that was a vernacular that yielded a pretty good building if you just if you didn't have an architect if you just some contractor just built one mm -hmm. um, we don't seem able to do that today um, and my desire for um, you know a better vernacular emerges in part out of frustration at the inability of modernism to have created one mm -hmm. um, to have created a viable, convincing language that, in fact, a non-architect could do and make something decent out of. Right. Um, in the way that, um, you know, an ordinary industrial building from the late 19th century is actually a pretty cool thing. Um, and it may, it may speak a language that everyone understands. It, it probably has a degree of craftsmanship to it that is beyond our ability to achieve today, except at a very exalted level uh, that is economically not possible for a factory. I mean, there's, we, there, we, we, there are all kinds of reasons, all of which uh, we understand, and none of which are particularly mysterious. Um, whether that process is reversible, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I think uh, architects haven't helped often with their degree of, of um, lack of interest in, even sometimes to the point of hostility to that particular problem. You may have just answered the, the next question I wanted to ask oh, okay. in part, but um, I'll give you a chance to answer it differently. Okay. <coughs> Which, um, if we take the example you've given of mm -hmm. the brownstone, right. um, 
the challenge on the other side of that is when the brownstone is reproduced today, right. it's reproduced in form, mm -hmm. but it has three apartments in it. Mm -hmm. So it's rebuilt in an entirely different spatial configuration right. with an entirely different set of living experiences mm -hmm. and conditions encoded in it that are no longer appropriate, one could argue, to the original form. And so I'm, I, it's some, what I wanted to ask you is why architecture matters speaks in some sense to the present. Mm -hmm. The question is what, what will continue to make architecture matter in the future? Um, and maybe it's this answer of the production of new vernaculars that, that mean something to us, mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. that's where the challenge is. But I'm curious, what will make architecture continue to matter? Will, is it, is it uh, a guarantee that it will? I mean, what's, what is the work? Where do you see the next set of challenges? for architecture. Well, while I think about how to answer that, <laughs> I will, uh, let me jump back to something you said a moment ago and, and argue with you about the brownstone for a minute, okay? Because I think that the, um, I don't see anything wrong with the, I don't think the brownstone, uh, the evolution of the brownstone into three apartments, and I must say actually those are pretty lucky people if it's only three apartments and not six, six apartments, apartments yes. <laughs> they're probably pretty good apartments actually. Yeah, being generous. Right, you're being very generous. So, um, but I don't know that uh, there's anything particularly wrong with that. In fact, we could argue that this is a, a sign of the great, an added sign of the strength of this building, that it adapts itself uh, smoothly or relatively smoothly to this. Um, I mean, I, I think one of the other problems in this country with our attitude toward buildings is that we tend to be almost a little too prim and puritanical about them sometimes. We tend to treat them as hothouse orchids that we have to just protect perfectly. And while it's certainly better to treat a building overprotectively than underprotectively, I mean, you know, we've, we've gone, as a culture, we've gone beyond the point where we knock things down willy-nilly and all that. Um, we have a very, I think, excessively prim attitude toward older buildings. And we're afraid that preserving them means literally preserving them in aspect sometimes. And in fact, you know, look at the Italians. I mean, they've been preserving things since before we were, you know, a country. And the, it, Florence is full of buildings that are 500 years old. And in fact, a lot of them have modern interiors. And a lot of them, you know, have other aspects of them that are modern. And uh, they tend to believe that if their buildings are good enough to preserve, they're sort of tough enough to kind of play with a little bit. And they're not, gonna, they're not these fragile little orchids that are going to die in a moment. Mm -hmm. And in fact, sometimes they become richer for that. Um, that is not to say, therefore, anybody should do anything to any building, obviously. But, and there are more ways to disrespect a building than to respect it. Uh, but respecting a building is certainly broader than keeping it precisely as it was originally created and intended. That, that's all I want to say. Yes. That, no, yeah. well, I, yeah. I completely agree with the okay. living character of right, the right. city and the and transformation of the building types. I think, though, that certain typologies mm -hmm. have functionality built yes, into that. Yes, yes. And so, for example, the notion right. of cross ventilation and, and air circulation in a brownstone is based mm -hmm. on its capacity to go vertically as well as horizontally, mm -hmm. which is cut off when it's divided into six apartments. That's why God invented air conditioning. Right. Well, so sort of we, if we think right, right, that the air right, conditioner is a, no, it, it, a sign it, it, of not, the brownstone no, it, working. Right, right, right. No, you're, you're absolutely right. No, no, you're absolutely right. And, and a, key, a key thing is lost in that. Yes. Uh, that's absolutely right. right. Uh, totally so my, true. My issue right, there right, is right. not mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that the brownstone is adapted to that, but that when we build them today, and here mm -hmm. I'm thinking of, you know, uh, brownstone Brooklyn as a term one mm -hmm. hears and right. as, as a way of preserving neighborhoods. Right. When what's being constructed are things that look like brownstones, mm -hmm. don't have, haven't been rethought in terms of their functionality mm -hmm. because there's still no cross ventilation. Right. Right, right, You've right, got right. to put an air conditioning unit through the window, or if you're lucky, through the wall. Um, and but we're uh, we're attached to the form. So in fact, well, we that's a, that's a whole different issue, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the one of the most troubling things about this time is the extent to which respect for history is misinterpreted or transformed into glib, superficial, and often, you know, horrendously trite and vulgar re replications of history. Precisely. Yeah, uh, well, the, the answer is yes, of course, I agree with you. Okay, so um, why does architecture and, matter? In right, right. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, there's, uh, 
there's vast amounts of, you know, cheap, superficial, crappy pseudo history going on there here, um, and uh, I don't like most of it any more than you do. And you know, I mean, the, the scourge of the McMansion and all of that stuff is, is a is a is a an architectural issue as much as it is a social and economic issue. Sure, yeah. um, but. In terms of where architecture, how and why architecture will matter in the future, um, I think part of it is not different from now. I mean, I think one of the things I was trying to talk about in this book are things that I, I trust are perennial things that will never go away, the way in which we respond to objects, the ways in which our memories and experiences affect our response to objects, the way we respond to space the um, dialectic, as it were, between comfort and challenge. Um, I, I think those things have always been true. They will continue to be true. They will mean somewhat different things at different times, but even as they mean different things now for each of us in this room, too. And that, that, will, not, that will not change. Um, I think some other things, however, will change. I mean, the, the, as more and more life becomes uh, a matter of cyberspace and we experience things more and more in virtual ways. Uh, I, I would like to think and hope uh, that the real becomes all the more precious as a result of that and that real space and real things in real time become more special. Uh, and what gives me comfort in believing that that will happen is the whole experience with museums over the last generation. You know, um, most people have forgotten, if they ever knew, the huge scandal that existed uh, around, or outcry, the, around the proposal at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I think it was the late 70s. Um, Walter Annenberg was going to fund this center for the study of art that was going to use what were then rather primitive computer technologies to have reproductions of all works of art. And you could go to the study center and actually pu punch up a picture of anything. And there was, a, and Charles Eames, Charles and Ray Eames were actually designing it. And it was a pretty amazing thing. And it didn't happen in large part because of a public outcry, I think led by Hilton Kramer, who was then at the New York Times, actually, um, about how this was the most disgusting, vulgar thing in history, and it would destroy the museum, and who would ever look at a real picture and care about it again if they could do this, and so on and so on. Um, in the end, Annenberg got so upset, he picked up the money and took it away, and it never happened. Um, what it was was a very early attempt to do what now, of course, any one of us can do at home on the internet. You can Google anything and there it is on your screen. And what that has done is actually make seeing the real thing all, all the more alluring, really. And it, it has created, it has not cheapened authenticity, it's made it more special. And uh, more people know about things that makes them want to go beyond what you can see on your screen and eventually, you know, and go to Paris and see this or go to New York and see that and so forth. Um, so, you know, I mean, if you, if, you, if you live in the middle of nowhere and you've looked at, uh, you know, Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, uh, on your screen for two years, it's more exciting to go to the modern and actually see the real thing. You're not, you don't give up and not care about it. And so, similarly, so, um, so I would like to hope that that whole thing will, will uh, replicate itself on a large, with, with, with architectural experience itself. Uh, that may be naive, it may not happen, but um, I, would, I would hope it will. Um, we're, you know, I'm always wary of trying to predict the future too much because I, I feel that uh, it's difficult enough to make sense of the present. <laughs> and if you can sort of figure out the present, which is hard enough, the future will kind of <laughs> take care of itself. But you can't hide behind saying that entirely. And, um, there's no question that uh, issues of sustainability 
which are not really discussed in this book, will become more and more and more important as time goes on. Um, and uh, we also, I think, will increasingly uh, have to face the question of as technology changes, as things become lighter and lighter and more and more easy to replicate, um, uh, what will that mean for architecture? And you know, we're already at a point where we see the beginnings of a viable uh, modern prefab technology. It's not quite viable. It's still more expensive than uh, it pretends to be. <laughs> but um, we're at a very different place than we were 10 years ago and all that stuff. And that will continue to make serious design more and more accessible, which is a huge cultural shift. Um, and I, I, I think we will continue to experience that shift, which is not, in fact, maybe a better way to put it is a shift that has existed in the world of design for the last generation, which is the movement of um, objects of at least reasonable quality into the mass market, uh, where they once did not exist. Um, that, that, that may begin to happen in the world of architecture as well. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of design, that is the great sort of development of the last generation. Uh, I, I think for all that is annoying about it and for all that is crappy about some of what they do, you know, Ikea is really the realization of the dream of the Bauhaus, mm -hmm. which, which had no reality when it was thought of. In, in fact, it was almost hypocritical in Germany at, in the 20s um, because it was so far from being accessible to the, mass, the masses that they pretended they cared about. Um, but now, in fact, you know, a certain amount of modern design has truly migrated to the masses, which is a result of both economic and technological factors, which I don't think will go away. And that will continue. And as we see that same set of phenomena play themselves out in architecture, that will have to change the way the culture views architecture, whether it will make for um, an end to the uh, sort of fake Spanish mission strip malls, or <laughs> whether it will uh, enable, in, in, you know, enable them to happen all the more. I don't know, yeah. but we'll see. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm reminded of, of um, uh, your colleague Kenneth Frampton likes to mm -hmm. refer to uh, Grigotti's comment about architecture not beginning with the primitive hut, but with marking the ground in order to make. Um, Order of the chaos. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that quote, mm -hmm. uh, and it's similarly here the suggestion that there is this kind of territory to be defended in the context of a new chaos. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think I think that's right. I think yeah. that's right. Um, but I, I worry about even conceptualizing it as territory to be defended, mm -hmm. because one of the things that uh, we are absolutely seeing in both in design and in architecture, uh, which are not separate fields anyway, really, but, but, in, but I think we saw it first in design, is uh, an increasing coming together of uh, high design, low design, popular design, mass market design, and so forth. Uh, that is not to say that they are one and the same. They're not. And uh, high design continually reinvents itself in new ways and new realms. But um, there is a place in the middle that once didn't exist yeah. and that a lot of stuff occupies now. So we'll see. I'd like to um, open it up to questions um, from the audience. If, sure. If, yeah, yeah, yeah. if there are yeah. or if mm -hmm. not, we can just keep having this discussion. It's kind of fun to sit down here. It is fun, yeah. Nice. yeah. Do you do this every Friday with somebody here? You sort of it's um, going to be hard to top this, but yeah, um, okay. um, we have a we have more than one of these, or maybe we have one and we'll pass it around. But are there uh, questions that we can refer to in anybody out there? If not, I'll just keep asking Paul more questions because I'm really enjoying this. Oh, okay. <laughs> so am I. All right. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, David, can I give you this, though, because I want, I want to make sure. Mm -hmm. 
I, I know you talk about uh, Mr. Jefferson's great lawn in, in the yeah. book yeah. Um, and this notion of creating a, a university, right, and, and a universe of knowledge within the context of the university. I'm curious to know, um, and we spoke some of this building that we're in and the, the 2 West 13th connection here. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen so far in terms of 65 Fifth at the new school and your thoughts about the new plan? If you, sure. don't, if you don't mind putting you on the spot. No, 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 no. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, I mean, it's still in evolution. The most important thing to say about it is the current version is uh, a thousand times better than the previous versions. Um, so I feel very confident about where, where it's going right now. Uh, the, I mean, it's very much an urban building. So... You know, it's not a building that uh, Jefferson's lawn, wonderful as it is, uh, offers very much, uh, sheds very much light on, really. I mean, it, it is a, uh, it's a vertical urban campus that, uh, as it's evolving, is going to um, have some, well, I, let me, let me, Dr. Say, I don't know how many of you have yet seen the Cooper Union building. Um, there is, uh, the architects would probably not want to hear me say this, but there are some similarities uh, internally in that there are going to be major sort of open staircases that will wind through and be both connections and public spaces in themselves. And uh, those, those things have been very successful at Cooper Union. Uh, it looks like they will be, as they're looking in the design that I've seen, Actually, a little less, uh, a little less contrived, let's say, than the one there. Uh, a little more relaxed, and perhaps therefore more effective. In fact, um, and you know, Skidmore seems to be trying really hard to uh, not be a big, arrogant corporate architecture firm, but to actually address the very issues that are on your mind and my mind and, and so forth. Uh, and, and the university has also come a huge distance as a client in this process, too. Uh, I don't think I'm going to offend anyone, at least not anyone in this room, by saying at the very beginning it was, it was not so sure what it wanted. And that was a problem because there was no clear program for that building and an architect can't do very much without a program, you know. I mean, and uh, the university kind of figured, oh, you know, get a nice building built up and we'll fill it up. We, you know, it, of course it doesn't work that way. And it's certainly not a way that architects can do their best work. Um, now that the academic side of the university is deeply involved in the planning process and has created a program, and that the architects are actually listening and responding to it, um, all we need now is all the money and to build it the way it's looking and then it will be good. <laughs> um, so, uh, but that, you know, that part of the process is, is now unfolding in a way that I feel very encouraged about. Uh, and thank goodness they gave up that short-lived idea of building half of it, which was at one point being talked about and presenting the entire world with a 16-story blank wall facing 14th Street. Um, that came and went within a couple of months, th thankfully, because uh, that was a really bad moment. Um, but it's recovered significantly from that, and the current version I feel very, very encouraged about. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful. You know. So. mentioned it briefly. Yeah. Could you just speak a little bit more about the links of, of, of culture and architecture and what, what is that? Well, do you mean the links between culture and architecture in, in which sense? I mean, that's a, a, well, a say, vast, vast subject. Yeah, so vast, um, um, say local, local culture and, co and architecture and how that might fa find expression or how you, you perceive that. Um, uh, is, that is that any closer? Or uh, Washington, D.C., defined by its local architecture. New York, the ah, okay. New York defined by its architecture, Detroit and its architecture, um, your thoughts and, and how the local culture... Well, you know, um, 
Let me respond in a way that, that may or may not exactly answer what you have on your mind, but it's what your question suggests to me. Um, we have a tendency to uh, almost uh, instinctively respect the role of place and believe that place has a powerful uh, um, defining role in, our, in, in, our, in architecture. Um, of course it does. It's not wrong. But as time goes on, and as I try to be clear-headed about this and, and look at the reality of it, I'm not so sure place matters as much as time, actually. Um, and I'm not saying that to sort of pull a Siegfried Gideon on everybody and, and say that, you know, it, it's all a matter of being true to your time and all that. No, I, I don't mean that. I just mean that inevitably um, there's a kind of, let's say, horizontal connection between places uh, that ties together periods that can sometimes be stronger than the place. Um, I mean, you mentioned Washington, Detroit, and New York. Um, if you found uh, an industrial building in any of, or commercial building, let's say from 1880, in any of those cities, I bet you it would look, they would look not so very different. That, that's all I mean to say. Um, and similarly, there were, um, you know, an, an office building built in 1962 would not look all that different, except there is the unusual condition in Washington of a height limit um, and the presence of all the monumental civic architecture. But that, that aside, uh, the differences would not be that great. Um, we want local culture to be important. It is, it is a virtuous pursuit, but sometimes it isn't, in fact, potent enough to um, transcend uh, other forces. And if the other forces are having a more positive impact on the place, it doesn't matter quite as much as we thought. Another way to say this might be that um, you would think that um, San Francisco and Los Angeles being the two great cities of California and California being where it is and all that, uh, and they're being not that far apart, that they would be fairly similar places. Uh, in fact, they could not be more different. In, in some ways, there, there's a greater gap between San Francisco and Los Angeles than between either one of them and New York. Um, uh, and I think the reason is that San Francisco is basically a city of the 19th century with a 20th century overlay, and Los Angeles is a city very much of the 20th century. Um, and therefore, it has more in common with Houston even though Houston emerges out of a different culture, the culture of Texas. Um, that, that's all I mean. Uh, not that, therefore, this is to be praised and we should say, OK, fine, that's the way it is. We should just be aware that it kind of plays out that way often, that, that the culture of a place um, has to be very, very, very potent to completely transcend the force of time. Um, Washington maybe to some extent does because it is uh, a unique city. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, not, many, not many places do. And, uh, uh, you know, a small suburban town, not a post-war sprawl track development, let's say, but an older uh, small suburban town outside of Boston, like, say, Newton, Massachusetts, um, probably looks a lot like Montclair, New Jersey, which looks a lot like maybe Bethesda, which doesn't look so different from Evanston, Illinois, when you get right down to it. You know, th those are the th that's what I'm trying to say. Um, not that it doesn't matter, but that it uh, matters in a funny way, maybe a little less than we like to think it does. And actually, uh, ironically, what maybe is more defining of culture is not a kind of general culture, but those monumental interventions and exceptions uh, that, that, are, that are unique to a particular place. Because um, it's such a triumphantly successful example. I mean, it's a case in which architecture truly was transformative uh, 
not only of a single small city, but of the culture in a broader way. You know, that was, there are these rare moments, and they are fascinating ones, and we've had very few of them in our time, when the most serious uh, art somehow excites the attention and captivates the interest of a far broader segment of the population than, it usually, than such a thing might normally be expected to do. And that was very much the case with Bilbao, where a building that, all, that was both uh, admired by almost all the critics uh, to an extraordinary extent and wildly admired and loved by the public. Uh, I mean, such, such moments are very rare. It's as if sort of uh, Don DeLillo suddenly was outselling Danielle Steele. I mean, you know, it'd be sort of like that, you know, it's sort of, or as if, you know, uh, well, you know what I'm saying. It's sort of, as if Philip Glass suddenly outsold Madonna in, in terms of music. You know, it is a, um, a marvelous, extraordinary sort of thing that happened because of a number of you know, sort of stars in alignment that don't happen very often and, and may not again. Um, the downside, of course, is that it made it look easy and made it, everybody say, oh, we want to do that too. And let's, let's have architecture matter for us in the same way. And suddenly everybody wanted to do that and uh, a whole bunch of buildings that are perhaps best forgotten <laughs> came hap began to happen in so many cities around the world. Um, and none of them had quite that effect. Some are good, some are not good. None of them quite had that amazing effect because it doesn't happen very often, that, that sort of thing. Um, but, and you know, and indeed Gary himself, you know, has sort of struggled with it. Um, so ironically, perhaps, you see the perhaps, role yeah, of architecture yeah, yeah. continuing in the, 21st century being that meaningful in a given area in a city? Well, I hope so. You know, I hope, I, I, I can only say I hope it continues to become meaningful, but I'm not sure. I mean, one other thing that's really important to say about, about Bilbao um, is that um, for all the way in which to many eyes it seemed like a radical kind of building, um, I always felt it was sort of the last great building of the 20th century, not the precursor of the 21st century. It's in some ways a very traditional building. I mean, it's all, you know, very that much about materials. It's a, it's, it, while they needed the computer to do the engineering, it's kind of built almost by hand. It's a different kind of form and shape, but, you know, this is, a, this is about materiality, that building, about very traditional things. And, um, and it's a building, Gary is a much more traditional architect than he sort of wants you to think. <laughs> um, and uh, whether the forces of technology and mass production and the various economic forces that are gonna act upon architecture in the coming generation allow us to do that kind of thing again very often, whether or not we want it, will be a very interesting question and challenge, and uh, I don't know the answer to it, really. Um, I, I do know that uh, Gary's Walt Disney Hall in Los Angeles, which in some ways I think is actually a greater building, um, has had a lesser impact, I think, than Bilbao, even though it's a greater building. Now, I don't know whether that means anything at all, but it, it is just a fact, <laughs> you know, that is what it is, so. Thank you. Yeah. take these last two. Oh, sure, uh, sure, sure, sure. Um, I've heard you say that uh, you thought that pe uh, pianos, New York Times building, may be one of the last buildings for a, a newspaper. Yes. And I read a couple of stories recently about museums in the 21st century needing less architecture, and one in the New York Times, which I'm sure you read too. And I'm curious, with the MoMA having an invisible building, what you think of the role of architecture in museums of the 21st century? Yeah, well, the role of architecture in museums of the 21st century is an um, interesting challenge. Um, I think there'll be a lot less of it in the next generation uh, 
uh, not for, for, for factors that really have to do less with architecture as with um, much simpler economic forces, which is that we built so much in the last generation, uh, it's very difficult to imagine that many places needing more. Um, we have, uh, the democratization of culture is an extraordinary event of the last 50 years, say, if not longer. Um, I'm not sure how much farther it can keep going, how much bigger the market can continue to get for art. Um, so, um, and money is going to continue to be tight, and there's an inevitable, we're in a period of some reaction against, uh, let's just say, extravagant buildings by star architects. Um, and pendulums swing. And so we're, we're definitely moving into a swing of the pendulum for all these reasons. So there's not going to be a huge amount. You know, we're not going to, there's going to be no risk that the architecture column is going to become the museum of the month for the next uh, few years. But um, that doesn't mean that the architecture of museums will not continue to have of existing museums will not continue to have a very important effect. Remember, let, let, let's stick with Bill Bao as an example. Um, Bill Bao is not um, a movie that is kind of over once it's had its run at the first at the at the uh, you know uh, at the Lowe's Theater. It's um, an ongoing thing, and new generations will see it and that will, they will bring their own things to it and it will be a different, an architectural experience for them that will be transformative, we hope. Um, so even if we're not in a period of making new ones, we will be in a period of absorbing what the last 20, 30 years have wrought. And, and that's actually, can, can, may yield a lot of very good and interesting things in and of itself. Um, Museum of Modern Art has always operated on a somewhat different model, which was that you show modern art in a space that aspires to neutrality and pretends to disappear. Um, that kind of worked at the Museum of Modern Art for a while. It sort of doesn't work at this scale so well. Um, and, uh, you know, so what they've done, I think, is only moderately successful with that and not terribly interesting. Um, but that's a whole other, other discussion. But you know, for a long time, you could say the, two, the paradigms of two different ways were the Museum of Modern Art and the Guggenheim. I mean, Wright's original Guggenheim, the, the aspiration to neutrality and the one that is based on the premise that neutrality is you know, horse shit and why pretend and the architect will do what he does and the artist and the architect will engage in a, a meaningful dialogue, which in fact has happened in many cases, including at, at the Guggenheim, where it can be very, that dialogue can be very powerful often and, and very potent. So, um, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect timing. Water's just running out. I'm very much fascinated about this idea of the three lives of an architectural project: right. the uh, sort of the vision, the execution, mm -hmm. and then the nostalgic com uh, component. And uh, what I'm curious about is if you have an experience um, in which you criticize a building after its execution and wrote a critique. Mm -hmm. That once you look through the lens of time, you'd like to go back and rewrite that critique in either a positive way or in a reverse and a negative way? No, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, let me first, before I answer it, um, take issue with your description of the third stage, which you refer to as nostalgia, which I think, I think is far more than nostalgia. I think, I think um, while nostalgia, when it exists, is a part of that third stage, um, it has the potential to be something far richer, deeper, broader, and uh, more profound than nostalgia. Um, it just incorp might incorporate nostalgia as well. Um, I've looked back uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I actually, this is an interesting time to think about that because this other book that I've just done, uh, Building Up and Tearing Down, which is a collection of articles mainly from The New Yorker, I had to look back and read everything again to decide what goes in the book. Um, there's not anything that I totally and completely, uh, I mean, I, I've never looked at anything and decided, God, I was, what was I smoking that day? You know, I was like totally crazy. Or what was I thinking of? Um, thankfully, nothing like that. But there have definitely been times when um, my views have changed somewhat uh, over time. Usually, I should say, um, to the negative. If I have any flaw as a critic, I think, it's that I tend often to be too, too forgiving of, intention, of good intentions. And there are several pieces I've looked back at and I think, thought, you know what, I was just a little too nice. And time has not borne out that, um, let's say, quasi-favorable view. Um, and I should have seen that those good intentions were basically not going to amount to much. And that building was flawed in a serious way, and it was not going not to work. Um, but... Uh, as I said, that's a question of degree, not of how uh, I think I vastly exaggerated the significance of the AT&T, now the Sony building on, on um, Madison Avenue, which uh, that's probably the thing that I come the closest to. Uh, as I said, maybe if nothing's 180 degree reversal, that's the closest to that. Um, because I was so fascinated by the desire to um, try to incorporate history with modernism and to figure out what should come next that after um, uh, when orthodox modernism had kind of run out of steam in a certain, in a certain way, which it really did at that period, um, that I allowed myself to overlook the fact that that thing was really kind of clunky, awkward, <laughs> ill-proportioned, and on some level sort of stupid. And, uh, and so time has not, you know, it has not worn well. And so uh, therefore my words which were measured enough, so I, I hardly said this is the second coming and the greatest building since, you know, the Seagram building. Or, I mean, I, I, thankfully, I didn't say anything as stupid as that. Um, but I was much more forgiving of the intentions, that's what I'm trying to say, than I should have been. And uh, now that I look back at that one, that, that's one where I really thank God. You know, I just, you know, I should not have been so goddamn fair to that building <laughs> because it doesn't deserve it. Um, and here and there, you know, there's other things like that, but as I said, ne never, never anything in which I feel I was totally and completely insane, thankfully. So it would be pretty awful if I, I, I did, but, but yeah, absolutely. You, you, um, I, mean, you, every, I mean, as I said, buildings change over time and we change over time. It's like two moving things and the relationship is always a dynamic one between you and a building. And uh, so I, I see a number of things through a different lens. And some of that may be personal maturity. I mean, all of us are a little more mature than we were 10, 20 years ago, right? Hopefully. And some of it is just the context of the time and how that shapes us all somewhat, too. So, uh, but um, it's. The other, the other thing, probably, now that I think of it about AT&T or Sony, is that, you see how guilty I feel about that. I can't <laughs> stop talking about it. Um, it also came at the end, it almost sort of signaled the end of the really wretched period in New York in the 70s when there was no money, yeah. everything was falling apart, nobody was building anything, everybody thought the city was crime-ridden and going to hell, and you know, that you should move to Houston or where there's a future or something like that. And this was the first major um, 
new office building, really. And the fact that it also appeared to represent a new architectural direction, although it turned out to be a misguided one and one that to the extent that it had value, that value was manifested better in certain other projects uh, in the coming years than it was in that one. Um, but there was, I suppose, a kind of desire to, um, well, an architecture critic is, should not be a civic booster and should not confuse his or her role with the Chamber of Commerce. Nonetheless, if you sort of love a place and believe in it and it's been coming through very hard times, there was probably a little bit of a desire to celebrate the fact that something big and expensive was happening <laughs> and uh, after, you know, things were in such a disaster for so many years. Well, so. It's, it's part, and mm -hmm. I, I, I support the correction of the nostalgia. Thank you. Oh, oh right, 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 right. Because the, the, this third making of architecture mm -hmm. is a making of history or histories, right. and they are constantly remade. Right, this, exactly. So to that, some that, degree, that's the that's critic is fortunate because you can't remake it in physical form, but you right. can make many histories of it. <laughs> Um, and, and, and you can, right, you can make your own multiple histories as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, I mean, at some point, it would be fun to write, look back and look at everything I see differently and try to figure out why and how and all that. Right? Well, I think, right. there's a, there's a, um, uh, I, I think there's a generosity of spirit in this book. Yeah, and, um, and if one characterizes that generosity as a willingness to be nice perhaps a little too often, um, I think the fact that you're also open to the corrective part of that as evidenced in this last answer is mm. uh, goes oh, thank to you. Uh, not just the tremendous contribution that your writing has made over the years, but to the generosity of spirit that makes places like this and this institution. I would um, highlight for those of you that haven't read the very last part of it, your recognition of Parsons Mm -hmm. and the role of the ah. graduate studio in architecture and all the faculty who've taught with you in that studio in these, in these last years as having had an influence mm -hmm. in the thinking about why architecture matters alongside a list of you know, the leading lights of architecture um, globally as, mm -hmm. as evidence of that generosity oh, well, and you. uh, your astute good taste. <laughs> wow, thank you. Well I, well, I can only thank you for being such an astute reader. I, I think, I'm not even sure my wife read all the acknowledgments that carefully. So <laughs> anyway, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Joel, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.